Hello, my name is Steven Sims. Welcome to the Off by One Security channel. I wanted to do a quick video on using Flirt with Ida Pro. It's something I see that comes up a lot, uh, especially with capture the flag challenges, sometimes malware and other situations where library code has been statically compiled into the binary. And there's nothing more frustrating than realizing you've been spending 30 minutes or so reverse engineering printf because someone statically compiled the code in and you don't have the symbol. So we want a way to be able to rule out that library library code, or at least see how we can go about doing it. Now, those capture the flag teams or other groups who create flirt signatures often keep those held close to the chest because it gives you a big advantage against other teams. Think about all the variants of Linux distributions out there and things like Red Hat and CentOS and Debian, all the different ones, and all the different versions of the libraries like libssl, libcrypto, and many other ones many, many versions of them. You need to create signature files for every single version because if you're gonna go and do something like play the DEF CON CTF prequels, they may link some obscure version of a library code and such. And the more flirt signatures you have, the more likely you're gonna be able to identify that library code versus other teams. If you're using something like Ghidra, there's tools like Rizzo out there, which is a, a script or whatever that does similar to what I'm describing here. There are probably other ones. Same thing with Ida, there are additional ones. I'm most comfortable with Ida and I've been using Flirt and Flare for years. So I figured I'll just show that one and try and be as quick as possible. Um, just a note, I normally do live streams on Fridays at 11 a.m. Pacific time. Sometimes I do video uploads like this one, but make sure you click on the live link in the YouTube channel. That's where most of the videos are going to be located. I'm trying to be good about responding to comments as the channel grows, it gets more challenging. Plus some of the comments are just weird. Some guy the other day was like, dude wears a hat too much, probably going bald. It's like, uh, no, I'm actually just lazy and don't feel like uh, you know, fix my hair when I'm going to be reverse engineering all day. Plus I need a haircut. So anyway, let's jump right in so I don't waste too much time here. The first thing we're going to do is compile a program normally, like dynamically linked program, and look at it in IDA and see how easy it is to reverse engineer it because there's there's there are very few functions inside of it. And if it were a capture the flag challenge, we could get to the gist pretty quickly. Then we'll look at stripping and statically compiling a program and you'll see the difference. Then we'll produce a flirt signature and see what happens during that process. Hopefully this goes perfectly smooth, but if we run into a bump here or there, we'll get it resolved. So first things first, if we look in my current directory, I've got a symbolic link to a folder, which is shared between this machine and my Windows machine. I've got a make file. I've got um, an old version of the program I compiled. Let me delete that real quick. We don't want that in there. Cool. So we've got um, the source code, which is a little CTF challenge. We've got PLF, PLF, RTB, and SIGMIC. Those are all symbolic links to uh, the Flare folder that I have. Flare is the toolkit you use to create Flirt signatures. We'll talk more about that soon, and I'll describe each one as we go through. But I'm just going to go ahead and make this, and we have now a program called OB1 Sample Bin. So if we run File against it, you can see it's not stripped, and it is dynamically linked. So great. If we were to take this now, copy it over to derp and let me run over to our windows system i'm just going to grab this load it into ida and let ida do its thing now watch how fast it gets done it's done already it says auto analysis finished because it's dynamically linked i'm going to zoom in when appropriate using the regular commands like you know, two and three on IDA. But when looking at the function name window, I can't really zoom in with IDA. So I can use the magnifier, but the magnifier causes IDA to lock up sometimes. So I'm going to bring it up and I'll close it when not using it. So magnifier and just zoom in here. All I want you to see real quickly is the number of functions is only 45. And we've got all these names. We've also got these uh, dynamically linked dependencies up here that are in the procedure linkage table section kind of like the imports table on Windows. Great, normal program. Now we don't typically statically link or compile, I mean, things because it makes the program unnecessarily large. It also, you might be compiling in library code that ends up having a vulnerability at some time and your program out there is, is on systems with that vulnerability in it, right? Other reasons as well, but those are some of the main reasons you wouldn't statically compile things. So let's go back over to our Linux box here. 
And I'm now going to edit my make file, and we're just going to add in here minus static and then ellipsy.a. I didn't mean to put a minus there. Let me get rid of that. So that ellipsy.a is a static library. In order to be able to create flirt signatures, you need the .a file. So that's one of the reasons why it's time consuming. You've got to run, you've got to get those files first. You can't create a flirt signature from a shared object file. It's got to be the static library. Now you can create a shared object from the static library, but not the other way around. So now that we have edited our make file, we're going to delete the original one here and we're going to run make. And now let's run file against it. Before we saw that it was dynamically linked, right there you can see it. This time if we look at it, it should say, yep, statically linked. So now it's statically linked. I'm also going to strip it. Right now it says not stripped. We're going to type in strip. And now if you look at it again, it's stripped. That means all the functions, names are gone, the symbols are gone. Great, so let's now copy this over. Actually, I'm gonna rename it. So move ob1, we'll call it ob simple bin, I'll put uh, static. We'll copy that to dirt. Run back over to our Windows box. And refresh this window. Let's grab the static one. Drag it over into Ida. Now before, remember we were at 45 functions. Now let's load this up. This is gonna take a little bit longer for Ida, quite a bit. Before it, it was able to finish the auto analysis, like it was already done by now. Now it's gonna take a while. One little tip in Ida, if you don't know it, is if you go into your view toolbars and kill the navigator bar for a moment, kill the function names window, as well as other ones if you want to, it speeds things up greatly. Those, for whatever reason, that part of the UX really slows things down. So you don't have to do this, but it's going to save you time. Once it's done, it's it'll stop at the bottom there where it's incrementing those addresses and disassembling the functions. I click on view or Windows Reset Desktop, and that'll reset it to what we want to see. So let's give it another moment here. What we should see, though, is that if we look at the function names window, there's way more than 45. There should be. Should be almost done. This is really helpful, too, clearing all these windows when you're dealing with a big file like uh, JScript 9 or something large. It's got to be close to finishing. So yeah, it's done. I'm going to go ahead and say Windows Reset Desktop, and it comes back. Now, if you go over to – I forgot the magnifier. Go over to our functions window. You can see not only are there 777 now versus 45, they're all called sub underscore and then some memory offset because we don't have the symbols. So imagine this was a CTF challenge and now we've got all this code. Now, obviously one thing you could do is go to start and I just, when, when there's no main function because the symbols are stripped, Ida should take you to start anyway. So I'm just going to hit the space bar here. And if we zoom in, that third argument that's loaded into RDI is main. So if we double click on that, we are now in main. So that's obviously a simple little thing we can do. But again, there are other ways we can make this more challenging for someone to reverse engineering it. And the point, we don't want to waste time reversing library code. If we put the navigator toolbar back up, you will see that all the color coding up here is for li uh, for regular functions, all internal functions. We want that to be library code if that's what it in fact is. Now, IDA does come with default flirt signatures that I think get updated each time a new version of IDA Pro comes out. But the problem is uh, there's so many variants. You don't know what was compiled and what version and what OS and all that stuff matters. So it's unlikely that IDA is going to have it in there by default. So we're going to generate a flirt signature now, load that in here, and hopefully map that all out. So let's go over to our Linux system again here. And we are now going to run the PELF tool. So PELF, I'm going to run it against libc.a, and we call it libc.pat for pattern. When we run that, it finishes and says total 1695. Now we can look at that if we want. We're not supposed to really. Um, 
thought we can. And what you see in here are these function names, like right here, assert fail. And then next to it, it's a bunch of um, hexadecimal bytes. Those are typically opcodes, patterns that it's identified that's unique from all the other functions in there. Sometimes though there are collisions, as you'll see in a moment, but that's how it's working. It's like almost like an IDS signature. So we'll kill that. And then next thing we run is sigmake against the pattern file, and we'll call it libc.sig. This comes up and says 19 collisions. So if we go and edit this, so if we look in here now, there's an exc file. That is the exclusions or exceptions file. We got to go in and see what the collisions are. So we'll say vim libc.exc. And inside here, you see, for example, double underscore ISWCTYPE is, uh, has a match to the same thing with underscore L on the end. And then IO put C has a match to F put C. So it tells you up here, you can add a plus sign in front of the one you want to keep or actually uh, resolve. And the other one, it won't resolve. There's, I don't have a lot of luck with it when I do this. There are other ways you can go about resolving the collisions. I've seen people get pretty deep into it, but the return on investment really isn't there in most cases because there was only a few collisions here considering there's hundreds and hundreds of functions. So unless it bothers you, you don't really have to worry about this. So what we're going to do then is delete the top four lines here and then write that out and then run sigmake again. This time, no message is thrown and we've got this sig file. The sig file is then what we want to copy over to our folder and then go back over to our Windows VM, and now we need to copy it over to the right location. So up here is a SIG file. I'm going to copy that and put it in my IDA folder. So program files, IDA 8.3, SIG, and then PC for x86, 64. We'll paste it there. Oh, see, there's already a libc.sig file in there. Like I said, um, the IDA does come with some default ones, but watch what happens. Like, actually, that stuff has already been applied at runtime, I believe. We'll just not do it for a moment, and I'll show you what happens if we try to apply the existing libc sig file. I'm going to go to File, Load File, Flirt Signature File, and then libc. It's kind of small, but it says libc, and it says version 5.3.12. I say OK, and adds it to the queue, and no, no results. So that's not the right version, right? That's why, as I said before, you find yourself creating lots and lots, hundreds of these SIG files. So let's go back over to the point. I'm going to rename my SIG file that I copied over. Uh, libc, I'll just call it underscore ob1 for off by one. And then I'll copy that one over to our IDA folder, IDA 8.3, SIG, PC, paste it in, uh, throw an exception here, uh, okay, I have no idea what's doing that. Let's jump back here and I'm just gonna copy it from the shared folder to my downloads folder, sure. And then, oddly enough, it should work. So there it is. Let's go over to C drive. It's one of those annoying anomalies that makes no sense, but we'll just go back over and, and ignore it, work around it. SIG PC. Paste that in. Hopefully, it, no errors. All right, it worked that time. Great. Almost done. We're back over in IDA. We click up on File and then Load File. Flirt signature file, looking for libc, and you can see libc ob1. It's small. You don't need to read it, but just know it's there. And I click OK. Adds to the queue. Now watch up here at the navigator bar. It should turn from dark blue to light colored. And there it goes. So it's applying all of those functions that it has a pattern match for via the signature file. So it's not done yet. I don't know why it slows down here in the middle in this instruction area. All right, it's done, not so bad. So I'm gonna bring the magnifier back up real quickly. 
So we can look at the functions window. And if we look over there, we could see everything, not everything, but most of the stuff has now been resolved. There's still going to be some that aren't because remember we had some collisions and also it's not 100% anyway. So we click on function name here. Most of it, like I said, is resolved. But if we go down towards the bottom alphabetically, you see sub underscore. So there's quite a bit that's not resolved there. Some of that's going to be the collision stuff. Some of it's other things that just wasn't maybe part of uh, the library that was compiled in, depending on compiler options and the like. But the majority of them, I would say probably 90% are in fact linked now. So we should have a main function at this point. If we don't, no, we don't. So let's just go to start. And in start, we can still go to that third argument. Well, even in this example, if we zoom in, those two arguments above main, they weren't resolved before. So now we've got those symbols, so we're good. But that third one is main, so we can just get back there again and look at the cross-references and such and ignore all that library code. So hopefully uh, that was valuable. If you haven't seen that before, it's definitely a great um, thing to have with, with CTF challenges and the like if you want to really get into those competitions. Other than that, we're wrapping up and we will see you next time. Thanks.